Mm -hmm. All right. So welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is Wednesday, November 15th, and Sarah Levine is with us to talk to us about what she's been up to and her most current research. Um, on the table right above her there um, is a, are a couple of articles and um, that's drawn our attention. And we were kind of interested in what you're thinking about, Sarah. And then we hope to also give some time for those of us here to kind of talk about what we're doing and messing around with and get Sarah's reaction to it. But we'll start with you, Sarah. Um, after we do brief introductions, I'm Paul Allison and I'm in New York City um, and delighted to work with uh, most of you here. Sidhi, do you wanna introduce yourself? Sure, uh, I'm Sidhi Donda. Uh, I'm a senior at Hopkinton High School in Massachusetts. Awesome. Cool, cool. Chris. Uh, my name is Chris yeah. Sloan, and I teach high school English and media at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah. Oh, great. And Chris, there's a new, I, there's a, a, group, a school in Arizona that it's taken a month for the principal to approve, but we're approved. It's a Catholic high school with mainly Navajo students. Um, and they're writing into the parent permission that anything that gets posted on Youth Voices may not reflect Catholic theology. <laughs> and, and, right. and I said, I said, I have, I have, I have somebody for you to talk to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. My students anyway. don't have a problem with that. Yeah, they let it rip. So sorry, little little business in between here. Go ahead, David. Uh, I'm based in the Bay Area. I'm in Berkeley. I've been a longtime collaborator and fan of the writing project. I was a former writing teacher, fourth grade, twelfth grade, ninth grade college, and then did a long time in um, education, technology, and publishing and literacy work. Um, and I think fair to say that David is uh, our our thought pusher toward <laughs> fine tuning and maybe collecting together texts and like to do that with, but we can maybe get into that as we go. Um, Nick? I'm Nick Kuyos. I taught for 33 years, just retired. I'm, and I'm the department chair. I taught AP Lit primarily and been working with Paul doing some different projects in New York, just outside New York City, about an hour in Dutchess County. Mazel tov. <laughs> cool, cool. Sarah, introductions and then go ahead. Uh, hi, sorry I'm so late. Uh, I'm Sarah. I uh, um, taught high school um, English and radio in Chicago for a bunch of years. And uh, now I teach English teachers, pre-service English teachers um, in the Bay Area at Stanford. Let me interrupt you already and say, radio. I love that you always say radio. Um, you know, we'll say like podcasts or this or that. Why do you say radio? Curious. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, it really, it, 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 it is podcasting. Um, okay. but at the time, uh, the, the recordings that we did, uh, podcasting was much less common. The recordings that we did, we actually shipped over. I would sometimes take them over um, by hand to our local, uh, public radio station. Um, and now everything is digitalized and we can get all of our stuff on digital and people still upload, um, and download, you know, onto our site. Uh, but yeah, it's cool. essentially podcasting. Cool, cool. The thing that the thing that I'm most interested about when it comes to podcasting is the writing aspect, because with radio or with you know when you have a, an audio uh, to take care of, you have to consider every word. You have to think about strong verbs. You have to do all the cool things that writing teachers want you to do, and you get to do those things not for the teacher, but for an audience who tr who doesn't actually know you outside of the classroom, and that's oh, it's so helpful, as you all know. So I just gave an example of please keep interrupting Sarah as she continues talking. <laughs> Sarah, were you in, Sarah? In, Ch yeah. in Chicago? Does that mean you knew the American life and the that whole? Yeah, and, and yeah, they, yeah. I knew. Um, I know. Uh, I, I know I should American say I've met Ira Glass, you know, two or three times and um, WBEZ is the local station there. And that's where we uh, yeah. sent most of our stuff. Yeah, that was such a source for that whole method. And yeah. yeah, yeah. And now it's everywhere. 
yeah, it's a whole aesthetic and yeah, and and method, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, enough to, of an aesthetic to kind of parody, you know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, what are you up to now? <laughs> I'm so, so well, now. Uh, I, I'll. I've been working as you all have with high school students um, who uh, are either just learning about or have for a while been tinkering with. Um, text-based AI, mostly chat GPT, because it's, you know, it's, it's really uh, accessible and uh, the free versions. And I've been working with a couple of teachers and students from a local high school, trying to see just at first how students are using chat GPT in the classroom and trying to kind of analyze what kinds of questions they ask, what kind of prompts they offer. And uh, when ChatGPT offers them suggestions or gives them output, what do they take up and what do they ignore and what do they think about it all? Uh, so we've spent a bunch of time with high school students and right now we're playing around with, um, with kind of typical school-based argument tasks, you know, with the kind of prompts you'd see on uh, you know, the ACT or the SA, well, not the, like the ACT, like uniforms in school or, you know, year round school, that kind of thing. Just so the, the lift for the argument part's pretty low so that we can see how they play around uh, with the tool. That's what we've been doing. Um, I have stuff to share if you want, um, yeah. but you all probably are be doing the same things where you are. So maybe we should just share together. Yeah, yeah but you start. That's, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I could. Oh, so Sherry, so do you want to present screen? Sure. That's what it's called at the bottom. Hit present. Could work for you. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm going to select a source, and the source is my entire screen. Yeah, use your entire screen, and then just change the tab. All right. I'm. A, oh Lord, have mercy. That's okay. There you go. That's perfect. Yeah, yep, yep. Okay, now let me find my stuff. So can you see these slides? Yep, it's it's great. Great. We see give three titles. Yep. Okay. So blah, 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 blah. Uh, one of the things I've been working with, aside from what our kids doing with writing, is how teachers can use ChatGBT. And mostly uh, I'm looking at how chat GPT can be used kind of as an example machine for teachers um, because contrasting cases um, and different examples are such a powerful way for teachers to help kids build, you know, principles and criteria. And because at least in English, they can be uh, really time consuming to develop. So let's say you want, uh, to present like five different scenarios about what um, what true love might be. And you want to give a lot of details. So just little mini stories and then students are reading them all and they're saying this one is more like true love and this one is less like true love and here's why I think so. Those can take quite a while to produce. Uh, ChatGPT is pretty good at offering different kinds of examples. And then of course you've got to tweak them because it's still a machine and it still doesn't know what it's, what it's saying. Um, but Mostly, I'm looking at what do students ask AI to do, what do they adopt, what do they reject, and how much do they think it helps. So here's an example of an argument task that we asked our students to do. Your typical, you know, we need a new mascot. What should it be? And uh, we asked students to just to engage with this prompt the way they would um, for, for a school task. And we gave them a bunch of kind of criteria here to see how they would kind of um, approach those criteria with ChatGPT as some kind of writing partner. So you see, is we need a new mascot, blah, 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 blah. And uh, we began to take a look at all of the prompts that students offered. There's 12 students. Right now they're working in pairs. So they're offering just a range of prompts, everything from content to uh, thesaurus kinds of questions. 
um, including, can you edit? Tell me if what warriors symbolize questions like that. And, you know, where am I and who am I and how do you drink water and where's the nearest 7-Eleven? All sorts of the same kinds of questions that your kids are asking when they're playing around. So what we mm -hmm. found, any questions so far? No. What we found is that when it came to tasks like these argument tasks, um, and I'll say at the outset that the teacher we worked with was you know, super awesome, but really, really nervous, really nervous about kind of introducing ChatGPT, the concept of ChatGPT as either a writing partner, an editor, a coach, a muse, any of those roles, because of, like many teachers, he was worried about uh, cheating. And they already had kind of a little, tiny little epidemic at the school. Um, and he was worried that he was opening the door, not only for himself, but for his entire school, you know, and he was unleashing this monster. And this, so- he, what, Was this in the spring or when? Yes, this was in okay. June um, okay. of last year. So, you know, and things have moved so quickly. People are kind of yeah. over that now. Well, um, not, not necessarily. Well, I don't know, yeah, is that yeah. true? What do you all think? <laughs> so yeah, he, he, he's yeah. yeah, some yeah. teachers are embracing it. Some teachers are really concerned and scared, yeah. Yep. So, all right. So that's where we're at. And, you know, in a year when we all have AI planted in our heads, people will be less concerned. But for now, uh, our partner teacher was, he was worried. Um, so we asked students to do anything they wanted with ChatGPT and to use any other tools they wanted. The only thing we said they couldn't do is simply generate an entire argument with ChatGPT and copy and paste it. So we are not, this study does not determine whether kids will cheat with ChatGPT. Some will. Um, we're just more interested in what else would they do? Could ChatGPT be a reasonable writing support for kids? Uh, so what we are seeing in this, in our kind of initial analyses are that almost all of the prompts that, that students are giving ChatGPT are for content. They want specific ideas about, in this case, different mascots, characteristics of different mascots, how to figure out um, what a good mascot is, um, what counter arguments might be against other kinds of mascots. That's the bulk of their prompts. And then there's a little bit of editing, a little bit of um, requests for uh, more power words or more flow. And that's kind of it. And we were surprised. We thought we'd see a ton of editing. We didn't. Uh, we thought we'd see uh, more adaptation um, of content. We didn't. And I'll get into that in a second. So this is this is number one. This is what students are asking. Any thoughts about this stuff? Yeah, I, I wanted to prompt Sadhi to jump in and say, uh, you've been using ChatGPT, is it, I think? Yeah. As 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 you've been writing different things, including your college essays, your college admissions essays, does this? How does this fit with your process? Is that a fair I'm, question? Yeah. yeah, it definitely is, and I think I would say definitely like varies because like when you're writing, at least for me, when I'm writing like a personal statement for college, I can't rely on ChatGPT as much as for like content because it's like personal content to me. But for like other assignments, for school assignments, um, I was like working on a presentation earlier today and yeah, a lot of it was more like content based than like editing. And like, I would say like, other than like personal essays, this kind of lines up with my uses as well as I would say like what I think a lot of my friends also like use. That's, that's actually, that's really good to hear. Um, and it's also of course, slightly worrisome because as you all know, uh, ChatGPT doesn't know what it's saying. So content, you know, is in a way one of the kind of more dangerous areas for for us to be concentrating with GPT, even though it's getting better and better and better. Um, and some of our students, some of the students that we worked with totally knew that. And some were like, oh, this thing is so much smarter than I am. This thing knows everything. So, you know, there's still some a lot of education to do in that area. I have a question. So when when you say like content, were students 
changing like the argument that ChatGPT gave or like um like aug like adding to it in some way or like alternating it or is it like kind of like the same like a chat gpt gave me an idea i'm going to write about this idea now um no it was mostly i have an idea um i think i know what mascot i want and now i'm going to get chat gpt to kind of outline the characteristics of that mascot and i'll lean on those when i'm writing so in that and that was comforting to uh, our partner teacher and to us. So ChatGPT wasn't thinking for them. Yeah. It was providing a kind of a backbone or some a kind of a an anchor. Is that yeah. is that your experience too? I mean, yeah, I think because I know I think a lot of fear like my teachers have and like rightfully so is that ChatGPT is gonna like make me not think again. But at least when I use ChatGPT and I feel like to get the best uses out of it, I have to come in with some idea. And I think definitely interacting with ChatGPT changes that idea and makes it stronger. But I don't think I've ever taken an idea from ChatGPT and just said, this is like the idea I'm now going to write about. Yeah, anybody else on that one? Okay. Um, I can show you a little bit. I've got just a little clip of students interacting with the tool. And for part of this study, we had students work in pairs so we could get a sense of their thinking. Uh, and here's an example of students deciding that they were going to use a husky uh, as their, their mascot. So they decided in advance, just as we were discussing, and then they asked ChatGPT to talk about the characteristics or the symbolic value you know, or associations with huskies. Um, and I think I'll give this a try and see <coughs> Excuse me. if you can hear this sound. Because he flipped the side. Oh, I was going to say for the wind, but oh, for each side works. Oh, no, yeah, I like husky for the wind too. Huskies for the wind. Huskies for the wind. All right. So, um, an opening, I think an opening could be like sentimental. Like so, no, yeah. Oh, we can also ask what do you, what do huskies what can huskies symbolize? Oh, okay. As another point, what can huskies symbolize? What do huskies? Mm -hmm. Let me say it says like hard work, um, because mm -hmm. huskies are hardworking dogs. The code is not hardworking, but it's okay. We'll go with no, that. No, but it's it's the thought. <laughs> Okay, husky symbolize strength, stamina, loyalty, there intelligence, independence. Boom, and their connection to nature. Oh, I can take notes and then you can like write anything oh, okay. when we come up with it. So, so that I think is fantastic. Um, Eastside is super involved in nature. You know the, the trips we go on. Eastside involves nature. <laughs> um, so they rep strength, stamina, loyalty, and. and Intelligente. Yeah. And independence. And yeah, connection. Yeah. Too. I think Huskies. Oh. So I'll stop there for just a sec. Um, so there's, you know, there's kind of lots going on. Um, and the when we showed this, just this little clip to the teacher, he was both, you know, like excited and kind of horrified. Um, <laughs> on the one hand, uh, they're engaging. First of all, they're reading. Uh, and I do think that ChatGPT might lead to a boom in reading. Because, uh, uh, you know, you're interacting with this thing and it's giving you output and not all the time, but many times the kids were actually reading the output. And so they're engaging with all these characteristics and they're clearly thinking that uh, these characteristics map really well onto their ideas. On the other hand, they didn't come up with strength, stamina, loyalty, intelligence, and independence. So what does that mean? So, you know, we're kind of bouncing back and forth with that stuff. So what do you all think? I mean, my like, like the first thought that comes to my mind is if let's say like this is assignment with someone like something students could do with a computer at least like I would look up on Google, what do Huskies mean? And then I'd end up reading like some like Wikipedia source or an article telling me Huskies mean strength, intelligence, this. So if anything, this is like, assuming it's correct, which is obviously like the big if, 
like this is just making my work a little easier. It's the great summarizer of all the information on the internet. That is a great point. One of the other things we noticed was that in, in addition to ChatGPT, people were going to websites, they were going to the dictionary. Uh, so it's not as though they haven't distributed their tools and their cognition already, they have. But there is something about it all being in the same place that makes it feel almost you know, too, too easy. Yeah, this is gonna sound kind of rote, but I mean, given that, I mean, City, to your point, you could have gone to Wikipedia or 30 years ago, gone to the library and come back with the same terms. And then you'd have a three by five card 30 years ago, or you'd have a web page five years ago, and that would be your source. And you, but, um, the fact to your point, Sarah, that it's so compressed sort of makes the whole experience just, I'm in another group, the learning engineering group, and there's been a long thread about, you know, the, the, the order of effort that people are using to get to that little package and whether that's okay or not. And I think, City, you just sort of summarized why it's just fine. But yeah. the, there, it, does, it does make a point that um, if the entire essay is constructed by these nuggets um, and one's simply doing sort of meta assembly, like cut and paste. And so it gets to these questions about what percentage of it, of the writing is original. And it also makes me think often of to what extent is there a reflection a piece that's a formal part of any essay that uses this at this point in time to sort of summarize how we're thinking about our own thinking when we use these tools because it does and it does raise that point no one questioned when we went to the library or when we started just using the, the, the world wide web but now we're questioning it all the time because we're just like two keystrokes and a couple paragraphs away from an entire essay being done right so it, it starts to find it feels like it might be compliant but you know, what percentage of the essay is original text? What percentage of the essay is just machine generated? And what are the thoughts about the use of the tool in relation to the creation of this artifact and this end product? And that presumes a lot of scaffolding and a lot of contact time for the teachers and the students and a lot of reflection time, which is very hard to secure in, yep. a, in, a, in a regular classroom. But it, 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 it makes those questions keep coming up again and again for me. Me too. And I, I do wonder if it is number one, we're going to begin to evaluate what's the value of a first draft as opposed to the value of editing and revising. And yeah. are these tools really going to turn us more into to editors? And yeah. if that's true, how how bad is that? And yeah. to what degree, to the degree that writing is a way of of clarifying your own thinking, of talking to yourself, how does this AI either interfere with that or or support that? Yeah. Earlier, when you mentioned it, like using like teachers using ChatGPT for examples, and so yesterday I was working on a college essay, and the prompt I forget what it was, but it was a little confusing. So I plugged it into ChatGPT and I said, give me an example of how a student might answer this. Mm -hmm. And then I did that three times and then I figured out how I wanted to answer that. And I think like that's <laughs> kind of like, it's a version of a first draft. I, I don't have an answer to the editing thing, but I do think like it saved me time. And I feel like my answers, the response I'm giving is better because I have like some like framework to work within and something where it's not easy to find a framework on the internet. So I really like that because to me, one of the most important things we can teach our students or that we can do ourselves is to look at a number of specific things and generate you know principles rules criteria frameworks and that's that's what you did so i think that's kind of super cool Thanks. let me let me show you um just another 30 seconds of this to ask you a few other questions so they keep going they are symbol of output. they're reading the, the output Okay. okay, I don't so think the rest of that is yeah, important, yeah. but those... those are good. It represents this. Mm -hmm. So I kind of got excited about that little move because it showed me that the kids aren't just, you know, uh, sucking up like a vacuum all of the data that ChatGPT is offering them, but they are now beginning to see what's salient to evaluate these ideas against their own ideas. And that's critical. Um, and that made me feel better about what ChatGPT can do. Maybe I'm being overly optimistic, so I, I 
what do you all think? I was kind of curious. Um, do they know they're being recorded? Yes. Okay. And do they have, have, has there been some talk about like, you know, don't just use copy and paste stuff from chat GPT, but think about it. The, the only instruction we gave them that we said, do whatever you want and use whatever other tools you usually use. The only thing you cannot do is have chat GPT write the whole thing for you. Mm. Otherwise they, they could have copied and pasted whatever they wanted. Mm -hmm. Now it's likely that they, they may have been more careful um, or more unwilling to do that because we were there. Uh, but by the end, they were doing a lot of copying and pasting of, of some fiction. So, you know, uh, it's hard to say. Sarah, yeah. um, I, I want to transition at some yeah. point to showing you stuff yeah. and thinking about it, but I want you to feel like you finished what you want. <laughs> I'm to okay. Is there more? No, I, know I feel you are, fulfilled. But... Yeah, this is, this is, a, this is a great place to stop. Is it? So okay, so here's here's I'm gonna I'm gonna take a chance. But how here. do I un? <laughs> oh, uh, down at the bottom, you stop presenting. Sarah, quick question while stop Paul's transitioning. Sharing. Yeah. Which uh, in, you were at San Francisco High School? Which I'm curious, which one, if that's what it was. Um, I can't I can't say. Oh, you can't say, of course. Sure. All right. For research purposes, for confidentiality. Yeah, but... of course. Okay, sure. Yeah. I should. Yeah, yeah, got it. And I, 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 if you click present at the bottom, it doesn't turn no, off. No, it's not, it's not um, letting me, but. Uh, uh, where, where do you turn it off? <laughs> nope, 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 nope. Did it present? Um, Aha. Okay. Unpresent. Okay, you found. Yeah. Okay. Good, good. So here's what I want to suggest. I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna say something big, and then you can tell me whether I'm crazy or not. But I think some of the examples that Chris and maybe Nick can show. Um, the move from I, I think we can we are ready to move from what what I'll call AI 1.0 to AI yeah. 2.0, right? Yeah. And maybe you're familiar with this concept already, but. 1.0 was when we, with web 1.0 is when we had text, we could see the text and it was convenient and all of that. That's sort of what chat GPT can do, right? But what we've been working on is, is not chat GPT, but building our own GPTs, right? Let's call it that. And the announcement on last Monday, you know, OpenAI's announcement with their GPTs and all of that, kind of, to my mind, clarifies what we've been working on. Um, so the so when the question, so I think, and, and Sidhi was, is, was so, sorry to point you out here, um, eloquent the, uh, a few weeks ago about how chat GPT is kind of dumb in some ways because of all of these other tools that we can build that use AI in a more intelligent, thoughtful way. And when students and teachers get involved in those tools, they see that they can build things. So I'm wondering any reflection on that sort of out there <laughs> pronouncement I just made. So do you, do you see that happening too? Or do you think? Uh, do I see teachers beginning to well, want to I'm build just things? Want, yeah, I'm just want. how do we move from chat GPT to other things that AI can do or yeah well I guess I mean uh, that's such a big question it depends on yeah, right. you know, what what we want what teachers uh, let's talk about teachers what teachers want um, and right now you know I'm mostly seeing I'm in Silicon Valley so I'm mostly seeing you know 5,000 you know eager ed tech uh, startups jumping all over ChatGPT and wanting to make some kind of sets of tutors, you know, in 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 the way that maybe Youth Voices has been thinking about, but you know, but dumber. Um, but but I think that, I mean, for the most part, I think. Please, everybody else, correct me if I'm wrong. I think teachers are just so busy 
you know, it's hard for them to be, you know, d developing, but maybe that's mm -hmm. not what you mean. It is. Nick, did you want to say something? Yeah. I mean, I, cause I, good. So I have to give some kind of historical background, I think, for me. And if I talk too much, just tell me to shut up, please. <laughs> I have a tendency to do that. So I teach at a, I taught at a suburban district with, pretty average students, um, not really applying generally to the most competitive schools, but most of them going to college. And so it wasn't a unique environment. It wasn't a, a really a bunch of gifted students, um, but we have basically ended up having a system where we had only in English, open AP literature enrollment. So you had no, anyone could go. And I had students who were self-contained students as sophomores who would be taking AP English literature. And the way that we achieved that was we created a very specific writing proto protocol that we used both horizontally and vertically. And so, and, and basically it was the whole course. The whole course had, I can share with you, the whole course had. Yeah. I think maybe not go there, but go go to the point you were making with it. Yeah. yeah so, so we we figured out a way to have students write really effectively, and so last year, for example, in a class of eighty five students, seventy took the AP course, and sixty five of them scored three or higher. Wow. And um, fifteen uh, fives and. 23 fours, I mean, just ridiculous amount of success. Mm -hmm. well, and the yeah. way they achieve that is because they understand things that honestly, me as an English major in college and, and graduate work, really no one ever talks about the things that really good writing does. And so there's basically four content mechanisms and five stylistic elements to all good writing. And if you can learn those nine things, then, and, and we, we skirt around it, but we just don't address it with specificity. And so I just, over the years, start to say, okay, this is the things we're going to talk about. Our single item rubrics only fo focus on those things. So when I started talking to Paul, I had a little bit of an epiphany because the greatest challenge is giving feedback to students on those nine items. It's really time consuming. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a hardworking dude, but <laughs> the problem is you have to sleep and eat. Mm -hmm. And so the teachers in my department, when I'd ask them to write more, because you do have to write enough. If you're going to write well, you have to write enough and you have to practice your craft. And, and it was overwhelming for them. So Paul and I have kind of been working on this. And basically, we've come to the place where we're going to start to present it to a district um, next week, but where you can actually use AI in a kind of different way. You can certainly use it. And I've done that with students as a content generator. We don't use the word claim just because we want alignment. We say critical stance. You could use claim, critical stance, thesis, they're all the same thing. And so you can use it to generate potential critical stances. And that's wonderful. You can ask it, you know, give me 10 different potential reasons why Blanche and Stanley have conflict in a Sri Karding desire and who's responsible. And it will punch those out and they're beautiful. And you can kind of use some critical thinking skills to narrow down and select the one that you think is most appropriate, the one that you think you could support the best. So that's great, but we're talking about doing something a little bit different and I can show you what Paul and I have been doing. Um, sure, you wanna share? Um, yeah, I'm gonna share this. You see that? Can everyone see that? Uh, we can yeah. see it, yep, perfect. All right, so this is an actual student's essay from last year and it's about death of a salesman. And it's one of the lit essays, you know, there's three essays on the AP. The third one is a literature essay where you write about some book that you've read in your life. One of my uh, stylistic elements of which there are five is sentence beginnings and sentence beginnings are a really undervalued, very powerful way to have students writing improve dramatically in a really efficient way. Because what students end up doing is if you're starting most of your sentences with nouns and pronouns, you're generally gonna follow that with a verb and you're gonna write a lot of simple and compound sentences and your writing takes on this kind of repetition flow and it's not really great. And so if you could start to use other things and then you have to identify those things, participles, infinitive phrases, subordinating conjunctions. When you start to teach students to do those things, 
And they don't have to learn a lot of grammar. They still learn a little bit of stuff. And so Paul and I actually created a thinking partner where it just talks, looks at the writing and says, how did I do it? Sentence beginnings. And it's astonishing. I, I, I was so blown away that it could produce this in one minute. And so this student's a really good writer. Uh, a student probably got a five on the AP exam. And so you asked it, does it do well? And it, and I can't see. I'm like, can I close this box? How do I move this? Oh, oh. I, I got it. I did it. Look at that. Okay. <laughs> so I love the conversational way that it addresses it. First of all, it's great that you're seeking feedback to fine tune your essay with your current level of preparation. A few adjustments can elevate your work. Let's start with sentences that have effective beginnings. And it shows you a few of those. These sentences begin with prepositions and a participle, preposition and a participle, respectively. There's a smooth transition between ideas. So that's great. So the whole key is if I can just get students, I actually give them a menu as part of this. And I say, you know, I'll force them to use 10 different types of sentence beginnings. And then, you know, they get amazingly fluent doing it. Now, when you start to change the sentence beginnings, all kinds of other syntax is impacted and verb use. And so then, it says, now let's consider these three sentences that need a bit more work in terms of variety and interest at the beginnings. And if you look, the student did this. They started three sentences with uh, a pronoun he. And did it's, you? It's, oh, wait. Yeah. Did, oh, no, you got it. You, yeah. You're still in the right right place. Go ahead. Keep going. Yeah, you wouldn't consciously do that. <laughs> you know, it's, I, I, I've read probably 20,000 college essays in my career. And it's really hard for a student not to start a sentence with I because it's such a personal statement. And then when you teach them, well, you can start with a participle or you can start with a subordinated conjunction and just kind of flip the order. And so it starts to pick up on these things and give students feedback. And so a student then, two things are happening. One, teachers become more comfortable because it is really fluent. It talks about infinitives and nouns and participle phrases. And so it does help teachers become more comfortable. And then students can, can use their critical thinking skills and go, OK, yeah, I'm going to change this one. No, I like that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm using anaphora. I'm trying to get a, a, a pattern of sentence beginnings there. So I'm going to keep that one. And so it's really wonderful. And so we did it with sentence beginnings. Syntax was even more astounding for me because it really teaches as it's helping students edit. It's teaching them. Nick, can I ask you a quick, can I bust in and ask a quick question? Please. Yeah. Yeah, see, I talk, you... I'll just keep going, Sarah. I'm like a machine. I just don't shut the hell up. <laughs> so I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, um, it, it has, have you um, given parameters to ChatGPT? Yeah, yes, okay. so, absolutely. And so and they really, Paul and I did this and they really have to be quite detailed. Like you, have, you know, the better okay. the instructions, the better. So I said, okay, here's 10 different sentence beginning types that you would want to use. He'll pull out, Paul helped me with this. Let's pick three sentences that are really effective. Maybe three that really need some help and then give some feedback on that. And with syntax, you, you have to say oh, simple sentences, compound complex, and compound complex. And um, so you do have to, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, I, want, I want to take a stab at answering that question because I think in that question is, is the heart of um, what we need to be thinking about, right? What I think would be exciting to think about, let's put it that way, which is that we do not go to chat GPT, right? We're using the same models. We're, we're now on Turbo 4, right? We're using the same engines as go to ChatGPT, but we stop before we get there and we say, instead of using that, that um, to quote Siddhi, that dumb guy, <laughs> sorry, I will quote you forever. No, that, that mm -hmm. instead of using him and trying to make that thing work, we're going to create another GPT and we're going to use that GPT instead, right? And then we're going to, and then we're going to eventually have. I, I don't know how many we we'll end up having. Um, it, it maybe, maybe. Anyway, we have to think about our list of eighty being too many, right? right. But, <laughs> but we can we can keep playing with with that, that kind of idea, but students also. And I was hoping some of the eighth graders came on. They are also building these as well, and so that they can they can also imagine, oh, I don't have to go to Chat GPT. I can make my own GPT, mm. and it can do for me what I want it to do. Right? It can give me the information I need. Um, in this case, it'll it'll look at the beginning of my sentences. Right? Um, 
Chris, can you jump in with some of your stuff? Is that too much of a jump? Let me close. Do... No, I think it's I another example. Okay. Sure. Um, Nick, I love what you're doing. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah, Paul. Uh, we're only, me and Paul have really been working on this a lot, and we have a lot yet to do. And um, so it's not suggesting that any of that other stuff isn't really great and important. It's saying, Wow, this is just a different kind of. Nick, I, I don't know if you have to say do. And, and yours, and then Chris. I do have to. That's very easily said, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have the first idea how to do Where that. Is it? Okay. Uh, what do I click on? There's nothing. Maybe you strange. don't have to edit. How do I? There's edit? a little X somewhere. How, Sarah, how did you do it? <laughs> it uh, there you go. It's gone. It's gone now. Whatever you did. Okay, Chris, you can share now. And, uh, and... Um, sounds good. I will uh, share. And hopefully I can figure You'll out present. how to not share. It. You'll present. Not sharing is harder than sharing. That's true. <laughs> okay, let's see. What do I want to share well, here? While Chris is um, yeah, go ahead, please. figuring that out, uh, I mean, I think what you're describing kids building tutors and coaches for themselves is is yes. ideal of course the question is how do you know what you don't know about what you need you know from your writing and that seems like the exciting part but the difficult part well that's what teachers can do yes you know? exactly <laughs> <laughs> but but yeah but then and and these are built in such a way that you can duplicate them easily. Then they can say, I really like the way that one does that for my writing, but I really wish it would answer my question first. And, and mm -hmm. so, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, that's an actual thing we've learned. <laughs> we've created these things that tell them about their figurative language in a poem, for example, the most recent example. Oh, wow. um, but then they're they're asking it, um, what's the theme of my poem, right? Oh, and, wow. and it's and it's giving them all the information about the figurative language, and they're like, "But you didn't answer my question, right?" But <laughs> so going back and having them put it, just putting in the prompt. All right, sorry, Chris. So I'll finish. Um, answer the question first has been very interesting because then it does answer the question, and then it does say. And mm -hmm. then now let's look at your figurative language and see how that supports your theme. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. So being able to play back and forth that way is really important. Go ahead, Chris. Sorry. Okay. Um, so, you know, um, Sid, he, you'll know this too, that the college application essay is this weird genre that um, it's, it's generally private, uh, you know, sometimes really um, soul bearing. Uh, because it's private. And then also it's one of those things where they don't get accurate feedback, it seems like, because everybody, if you're writing about something, you know, tragic in your life, everybody's going to want to support you and not give you feedback. So it seemed like a good thing for AI to give some uh, feedback here. So um, Paul and I, but mostly Paul, looked at this book, um, Real world writing, I think I forget what it's called, but the chapter uh, in it called That's "Demystifying it. the College Admission Essay Genre" by Jessica Singer Early. Um, basically, you know, we took some instructions from that and turned that into a script that could read students' college admissions essays and give them feedback um, quickly, and then also um, accurate, pretty pretty accurately um, or helpful. I think they found it helpful. So the one that I would key in on is, um, let's see here. Yeah, so I'm showing right now, um, like these are the elements of the key genre elements of the college application essay. And, and a lot of them are pretty predictable in my book, you know, like have a strong writing topic, write for the appropriate audience. But number five, um, you know, four says use description, but number five, writing the so what, I think my students didn't really do that. They were always, they could tell a good narrative, no problem. But then the idea of stepping outside the narrative to emphasize the significant of a particular topic and the lesson learned, 
you know, why does this matter to this person, this anonymous person who's reading this essay? So for the most part, my students had never really thought about that. And so what we would do, um, first of all, I turned this into kind of more of a readable document for my students, kind of, you know, I changed the, I condensed it and then changed the pronouns to like, you know, you should do this, that kind of thing. But for the so what, um, that was the part of the chapter that they read. And, and it's, you know, making the rhetorical shift to a persuasive purpose as opposed to just a narrative, telling the narrative. Um, and so what uh, we did was we used youth voices. And I'm going to try to do a live demonstration, I think. Is that fair enough? Yep. Go for it. What could go wrong? Um, so um, there's my AI Mojo plugin on a WordPress site. And um, what I'll do is I'll go to templates. Or actually, I'll go to chat GPT here. And I will go to the, well, here's the live part. That's You're going to go to a persona, right? So what? There you go. Yeah. So, um, so let's say this is a middling essay. This is someone who, um, you know, it's, it's not great. It's, it's just starting and it's emblematic of kind of early phase drafts. So if I put in the, so what, uh, persona and click send, it's going to give me back some feedback about the, so what part of the essay here. And so um, my students found this one the most helpful, more so than like description and that kind of thing. Um, and, and I'll just read it about the feedback was your acting for path, your passion for acting and fashion entrepreneurship is clear and compelling. Now let's consider the so what part of your essay. Ask yourself, how have these experiences shaped your character or prepared you for college? How have you grown as a person from these experiences? Which values have they instilled in you? Next, we can discuss your storytelling, how it ties to your audience and ways to effectively use metaphors. What do you want to unpack first? And so since it's generative, I would say um, I'm not sure about how to use metaphors. So, Chris, right. could I just, um, yeah. as, as that's generating, just say yeah. that the, the persona was written using some of Jessica Early's actual language for how she describes this for students. So, and some of her categories and everything else. So the persona is this pre-trained GPT, let's call them now, right? That is mm -hmm. now answering, go ahead. Yeah, and that's based on that chapter um, mm -hmm. yeah. from Jessica's work that was you know based on a study where she worked with high school students. Um, but, you know, one of the things that my students liked was, uh, well, there obviously there's a couple of things. Um, it was quick. It gave them feedback, but it was, I, I had them do it in the part of the draft where they were all still kind of struggling with things. They didn't have it all polished and ready to go. They were still thinking about like what they were trying to say. And so when I meet with students one-on-one -on -one to talk about this, it takes a lot of time to try to get to the point where it's like, oh, what are you trying to say? So, you know, what I found was this was really helpful because they got through this earlier phase a lot quicker. And then we had really good conversations about, you know, the writing itself. And, and um, yeah, anyway, I thought it was more efficient when I actually sat down with them and talked to them because they had gone through this kind of early phase where they're, you know, it's the big granite block and they're just kind of chiseling in the beginning. Chris, there's so much more you could show. <laughs> but, yeah, uh, I know. I know, but yeah. And because you collected all of their responses and thoughts about this process. Yeah, and then I did like in here, um, you know, this was just me messing around in this draft, but I was showing it. It's like, all right, can you tell me now how helpful this was? You know, write your feedback. Um, so, you know, I did have them critique the feedback and and talk about it, give feedback to the feedback. Um, and I, yeah, it was helpful for sure. Yeah. But in Go the ahead. interest thoughts, of time, thoughts, I think questions, yeah. Yeah. Just both of these tools are super cool. Yeah, that's cool. 
So here's my here's my discourse question. <laughs> like, so meaning meaning, and I'm talking to a researcher right now, right? You're talking to you, sir. I'm, I can't. How can we get researchers to like research this part of of how we're using a, AI in schools? And and not necessarily go to the corporate mm -hmm. chat GPT thing, right? That everybody is glomming onto, right? I because there's so much more exciting work that can happen before chat GPT. Yep. Yeah. I, I do think it's coming. I you know, a universe academic work is always two to three years behind, which makes in this case, which makes us almost completely useless. But I, I, I do think the research is coming. I just read a piece on uh, comparisons between human and AI uh, feedback um, from writers' perspectives, showing things like uh, AI was much more positive and easier to follow. Um, so it's it's coming. Um, I think. So can I say sorry? Yeah, Theodore. yeah, yeah. So I, I want to ask it a different way. I want research on, I like students get really excited about, oh, I could make my own like bot, right? So where is the research on their creativity around all that, right? Yeah. So that, so, so, and, and that's why I, I'm saying it's AI 2.0 because mm -hmm. like, like the web 2.0, we now can make it ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. We don't have to, we don't have to just use this text that was produced by chat gpt mm -hmm. so yep, anyway yep. that's i'm, I'm it, off my podium for a little bit <laughs> yeah and it, it almost I, I feel like almost what we need and i think some of you are actually working on things like this right now are um uh learning experiences for teachers so that they number one aren't too scared and number two uh can learn how to help their kids navigate and create these you know fairly simple uh it, tools so i think that we and there's research to be done in there for sure but i think the more professional learning maybe we can provide for teachers the more aware everybody else becomes that kids individual kids and in individual classrooms are doing this kind of thing so as you're you're launching or you're trying out these projects in in classrooms, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. And then maybe too, um, when you've got experiences for teachers, uh, I mean, well, I don't know how to answer your question besides no, saying no, no. I, I I just saw it tonight as a, a way to have dialogue around all this. Yeah, and, yeah, 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 yeah. And absolutely, the Chat GPT research is useful. And and you know we're learning from all of that. I mean, you know it's not not useful. I just I just want the other thing to be on the table too. Of course, yeah. and I, yeah. I yeah. but I do think that like most things, the teachers and the students are going to be way ahead of the researchers. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, Paul. One thing, and having done a lot of tech stuff and and appreciated the way as a tech liaison or what was the role that you had at the. In your writing project for that's that's close project. yeah that's that's a good name yeah yeah, yeah. You, you were like the tech liaison and you were sort of the advanced group and there was a handful of you and you in particular were unique in the what you were doing and so forth and i did a lot of work with the writing project sort of adjacent other things i mean the amount of things you're uh taking as sort of anti to come into this engagement are really high you know um you know if i think think like a teacher the amount of time that the computer is going to be part of the workflow, the amount of process that needs happening. I can see it in what, Chris, you're doing, even watching your um, lesson planning and listening to you, City, as well, like the amount of um, workflow that you're managing. Um, and that's already like that's a, that the throughput on that is really big and not, you know, not a lot of teachers are, are, are operating like that. So to answer your questions, very rudimentary response is, the play and the engagement model that you're you've designed into this AI this AI Mojo plugin on the top of an you know essentially a, a really robust wiki tool called Now Comment um, is really it's like a it's like a souped up race car in a garage right 
and it comes out on the street and everyone's like, whoa, what's that car, right? Uh, but no one's driving the race car, not which, but but everyone wants one, and and I think it's a matter of having the time to build that out. And um, so, where would that research be happening? I mean, the, the dynamic that you've laid out in terms of the, the learning model is really powerful, and the critique that happens. And city, it's really fun to have you around, city, as someone who's published, you know, on CNN of all places, right? But and then you're talking about the way that you engage things, just as a practical example of your own um, workflow is really powerful. So, I mean, I don't know the answer to your question, Paul, it, but it's I, a hard yeah, one to solve. I didn't, I'm not looking for answers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I no, just, but, uh, but he, what are you thinking? Yeah. I just want to add, so I, so my school for the longest time had chat GPT blocked. And actually, I think this Monday was the first day we could actually use it on school Wi-Fi. And oh. to be honest, I'm not exactly sure how long it's going to last for. Because I don't know how many, like, I, I'm not sure if it was, like, an intentional decision that was made because I know our school is going through some, like, tech <laughs> revamps. Go, fi go figure, yeah. <laughs> but I think, like, at least in my school and I think in my community amongst the teachers, there's still, like, there hasn't been, like, I know, like, there's been, like, no professional development. Like, I think that you guys are talking about to, like, get, like, teachers, like, on board or at least even, like, introduced to it. So. And like, I know like how like overworked like the teachers are in like my district. And I think that's like a kind of like a common like theme. So I, I like, it's like, I, it makes me like sad to think that there's all these like awesome tools being like developed by like people like you guys. But like, I'm like, sad to think that like, I think it will be like at least like three, four, maybe even five years before like, it's like actually adopted into like a school like mine or like other schools. Yeah, I think yeah. Uh, everybody around here is, uh, going gaga over this thing called uh, magic school which is like already prepackaged um stuff for teachers um you know how to write an email to an angry parent um so i think there's going to be these slick packages put together that are not what paul's talking about you know these things are going to be um you know released very quickly and there's going to be a lot of money made uh and they're going to be districts saying you should use this tool Yes. So, I mean, we've been here before, right? Yeah, just, yeah. Yeah, I just, yeah. Yeah, and the amount of effort that's being put into this in terms of test item creation, um, productivity, gains, mathematics. I mean, the, the process learning model that's implicit in a writing experience and the collaborative social contract and the social dynamic that happens through feedback and conversations like this, right, uh, has overhead to it. And yet this is so central to the thinking and writing process, and ma and it makes it all immediately transparent. Mm -hmm. And I, I I'm so struck by the way metacognition has sort of risen to the surface because, to actually anticipate what you want to ask the AI, you have to sort of assemble a, a, a logic model in your head, yeah. um, and, and it's quite intricate what's being assembled. And city, you described sort of that method earlier tonight, mm -hmm. um, and uh, being able to capture that and describe it as a learning experience and indeed a learning outcome and setting the framework for the teacher and the student and even the families to understand that as part of the, the workflow. It was also interesting having done a bunch of, Paul, you know this intimately, having worked with digital storytelling and the way media and technology tools for media creation. And Sarah, I guess as a, as a radio producer, you certainly did that. You watched what mastery looked like when people shaped content, right? And you refined it and you made mm -hmm. a, a motion graphic or you did whatever. Mm -hmm. And that represented a certain benchmark in terms of skills acquisition and mastery of a form, right? And this is happening so quickly and in such a fluid medium. I mean, people, what's the the Wolfram term is that all this stuff is now functioning like what? A linguistic user interface in the computational stack that we're all gonna use going forward, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's like HTTP is gonna, the, 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 the chat GPT in five years is gonna be known as the linguistic user interface and it'll be three other things. So it's all happening so amazingly fast. Um, but I, but I want to see your well, car come buzzing down the block, Paul. I just, I run to the door when I see you I pull know, it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, got it. That, can I just Sarah, jump in? Sarah, yeah, yeah. And then we'll give Sarah last word. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> you don't want last word. You can. Yeah, Dave, I, you know, Dave is exactly right. I, I, I just, like, that was so clarifying for me. And, you know, we forget I, I, for, this is only, how long has it been really where people, it was in people's conscious focus four months, six months. I mean, it's ridiculously recent, February, January. Yeah. I mean, you know, and so we've actually come pretty far in a short time.
comparative to our ingesting the internet when that first came out, that devil, like people went crazy in schools that the internet was going to be there and then mm. no they're going to read again. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But David's point about metacognition is so great. The mm -hmm. idea that teachers, we have to, it's, it could make us better where we start to metacognitively articulate what we really want. Like sometimes we don't even say that. We just say, you know, we want to look like something or to be good or better. And so, because if you right. or, or here are some sentence stems, yeah, um, put them in yeah. this order. Yeah. And so we have to tell it to do the right stuff. Because we, we, when Paul and I, would, I'm sorry, I'm talking too much, but when Paul and I told him to do this, we, we did an introduction and it's, it, it gave some advice that was completely flawed about putting mm -hmm. examples in the introduction. And that was our fault. We didn't clarify to it. And so that was a great learning model for us. And so I agree, David, this whole idea about medical distance is great. Yeah. yeah. You know, Nick, it's funny, I think uh, an area that researchers are beginning to kind of educational and sociocultural researchers are beginning to kind of nose into is the kind of whatabouts of uh, Gen AI and those include um, now there is going to be a formula for writing. It's going to be even more uh, ingrained than before. And who says examples can't go in an introduction now? No one's going to learn to be creative. And what kind of language is it that students are now going to see more and more as a model of language? And what does that mean for kids who don't speak that language and so on? Yeah, great point. Mm -hmm. And so, and I always tell students, that's such a great point, Sarah, that, you know, you learn a model, a formulaic model, so that you can eventually break it and be great, right? Like the whole idea is you can be good doing this, but to be great, you have to actually break outside of it. So that's so true. I remember one of my kids saying to me something like, well, can I just skip? you know, <laughs> the part where I learned the model and just go straight to the uh, the breaking part because that's what I'm doing now, so. Yeah, they like to do that. I see people do that. I think Picasso could have painted a bowl of fruit pretty effectively if he had to, right? But, you know, right. the whole idea they broke out of that model. So I'm going to release us. Thank you so much for staying over here. And, and Sarah, thanks for the dialogue. And um, yeah, we'll keep yeah, going. Super fun. Yeah. It's, it's fun. really, really cool what you're doing. Okay. Thanks. Great. Good night. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Good Thanks, night. everyone. Thank Good you. night. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.